Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Wednesday, July 8th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps and steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is live to tape, as I say. We are on vacation this week, but we have all new content for you. It is unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't believe this. On the program today, Greg Mitchell, from editor and publisher, he's an author of, I think, a dozen books. Author of The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. I'll talk about that uh, more in a moment. Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, um, it's a fascinating story, and it's so important. And uh, Greg Mitchell has been one of the few people, and he's written a couple of books over the years about, um, about uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, we are now 75 years out. The bombs were dropped um, 75 years ago, uh, August 6th, I think, 7th, well, August 6th and 8th, uh, over the course of those three days, the two bombs, I believe, were dropped. And um, this country's understanding of what we did is um, so woefully ill-informed and... You know, I think there are moments in history where you can say, had had this happened and, and it was interpreted in that way, or in a different way, or in really, frankly, in a truthful way, we may have had to um, change our behavior. It would change the course of history in many respects. Um that the and he tells the story of how we really by we I mean we as a country um, really never fully particularly in the moment but that's also how in many respects how history is is written um, uh, uh, were aware appreciated understood a the implications b the Necessity or lack thereof, and the implications to, to human to human beings of of dropping both those bombs, and there's a lot of narratives out there that exist about why we needed to do it and how we had no other options that are really um, not true. And uh, Greg Mitchell tells this story via a fascinating sort of like side note of that history. In the wake of that history, there was an attempt to make a movie about that decision-making process and about the Manhattan Project. And um, if you don't know, uh, look, there's a lot of people who listen to this program who are who are younger uh, than I. I um, mean, a lot. There's a lot of people who are younger than I in our society. But um, you may not know this history, and there are a lot of people my age and older who think they know this history, but don't really know it. Um, Greg has been on this program before, but many, many years ago, talking about another book I think that he did about the um, uh, about uh, the uh, atomic bombs that we dropped. Um, so uh, enjoy, I guess. I don't know if I would say that. Um, remember that uh, 
you can listen to uh, the AM Quickie every day if you're missing sort of the news of the day. Um, you can you can sign up for that at amquickie.com, or you can just search for it on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify. I don't know if it's on Spotify. I think it's on Alexa, if you, you know, dare use that. Um, and it may very well be on your Google Play or whatnot. So it's amquickie.com. You can sign up at amquickie.com as well. Uh, check that out. It's also on the app at majorityapp.com. If you get the uh, Majority Report app, uh, you, which is free, of course, for iOS and for um, uh, Android, you can it's, it's on there every day, too. So uh, you can get the news of the day. You can get it uh, for the past couple of days. You can get it for the p- couple of days going forward uh, as well this week because we're not going to be live. So obviously you're not getting our your daily news from us. But here's here's my prediction. Crap show. Crap show. I'm recording this on Thursday of last week and uh, record breaking uh, infections in Florida. I think it was over 10,000. It's going to be more than that by this time next week. I would imagine it, it, it could be 15,000 a day. Uh, by that time, it, it, it could conceivably be more. Um, but remember, you know, when we say 10,000 today, what we're really talking about, people got infected about two or three weeks ago. So, and there's, you know, they're just starting to slow things down there now. So, uh, amquickie.com. Also, one of the things I'm doing on, on my staycation is I am trying to just upgrade my situation. Part of that involves negotiations with my my former wife, whatnot. But one of the things that are happening, that has been happening, is, you know, we have to sort of uh, divvy up stuff like housewares and stuff like that. And for me, my secret in this whole process has been like, oh, I really like those really bad sheets. You can, you can take them. You know, I pretend I like the sheets, but what I want to do is I want to replace everything with Brooklyn and stuff. Because I got a couple of pairs of Brooklyn and sheets, and they're fantastic. I want to get Brooklyn and towels. I'm going to get uh, Brooklyn and bath rugs. What else do they got? They get they have loungewear too. I am not so much into that because I don't I don't lounge. I'm just constantly working. But you may be aware that Brooklyn is the internet's favorite sheets, but they're also home to bedding. That's the other thing. I knew there was one other thing I was going to get. Bedding, loungewear, towels. They have over 50,000 five-star reviews um, and counting. They were the first, Brooklyn and was, the first direct-to-consumer bedding company. They make all luxury products without the luxury markups. My Brooklyn and towels, I mean, excuse me, sheets, are awesome. And the pillows. I finally found a pillow that I like. I've got two King plush, hypoallergenic, of course, for me, pillows, and they're awesome. They've moved beyond the bedroom. They now offer bathroom and life essentials like towels and shower curtains, even ultra soft loungewear that make you feel like you never left bed. You've got to check this stuff out. It's incredibly good quality at a very, very reasonable price. Uh, in fact, a low price for luxury stuff. Um, my favorite is the classic cotton Brooklyn and sheets, but I may, the, the pillow is starting to like become my favorite thing in the world. I'm surprised I don't even bring it onto the show. I'm hanging on for dear life. Brooklyn.com is the perfect place to start making small changes that make big differences in your life. Brooklyn is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, loungewear, I'm going to get a comforter. Towels come with a lifetime warranty. So go on, make yourself comfortable, do it. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use the promo code majority only at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Check it out. All right. Also, um, if you're starving for content, like I say, AM Quickie is there. You can become a member of the majority report. You can go back in our archives On our app, you can search all the archives. You can find all sorts of amazing stuff on there. Members are going to get a deep archive show either today or tomorrow or the next day or yesterday. And uh, also, TMBS happened last night, the the Michael Brooks Show. You can find that at patreon.com slash TMBS or youtube.com slash TMBS. 
You can also check out the Nomiki Show, patreon.com, the Nomiki Show, also uh, youtube.com, the Nomiki Show, and uh, the Antifada is happening. You can check that out, patreon.com, the Antifada. Jamie's and crew are doing multiple shows this week. And Jamie is also, um, I think she's going to be in, um, she's going to be in, on a panel on the virtual socialism conference. Oh, that was the other day. But you can probably go back and check that out too. And also, of course, uh, Matt is on Twitch TV, uh, twitch.tv, uh, Literary Hangover. And so uh, just search uh, Literary Hangover on twitch.tv. Maybe it's twitch.tv slash Literary Hangover. He's uh, gaming and uh, listening to books. Yeah, I know. Weird, but people love it. All right, quick break. When we come back, Greg Mitchell, the, binning, the, excuse me, the beginning or the end, how Hollywood learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program author of a dozen books, the ed- former editor of Editor and Publisher magazine and a longtime blogger for The Nation, and uh, on his most recent book, The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood and America Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Greg Mitchell, uh, welcome back to the program. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you. So, um, Greg, uh, we have spoken in the past. You have written um, um, multiple books uh, from different angles about uh, the uh, the dropping of, of of two nuclear weapons on on Japan. Uh, what, let's just start with this: uh, the the beginning or the end? It it was a, a film by MGM. Why um, why tell this story? Okay. Um, well, I, I, I should remind people this is the 75th anniversary of the uh, of the event um coming up um and um the movie uh, to me encapsulated um a lot of what was going on after um after the war ended um in terms of the what uh, called the official narrative which is that uh, uh Truman had to drop the bomb it was completely necessary uh there really were no other options at that point uh, that it pretty much alone ended the war and that uh you know Americans also had to get used to the uh you know to a new nuclear era with uh, more and bigger bombs and um so to me it's always been interesting as something of a media maven and historian um that whole post-war period for how this developed how that narrative developed and, and it really has carried through to this day and I think that's what makes the book so relevant now um but but also all the other the things that this narrative made possible, such as the, the hydrogen bomb and the arms race with the Soviets, which was so costly in so many ways. And, um, you know, and again, people might say, well, why does this matter today? You know, this is 75 years ago and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, not only can you not change the movie, but you can't change the fact of the dropping of the bombs and killing maybe 250,000 civilians. Um, there's nothing you really can do about that. But, you know, the fact is what, what has driven me for actually for, for a couple decades or more, uh, this is the third book I've written sort of on this subject, is that America today still has a first-use policy. Not many people really know that, but it is still official U.S. policy um, that we will launch nuclear weapons first, in ret- not in necessarily in retaliation, but in response to a conventional attack uh, or even just the threat of a conventional attack, you know, from an Iran or North Korea or whoever. And, of course, Donald Trump is still in charge with the nuclear code. So to me, this is not really a story about the past. It's really how this, this narrative of uh, for Americans accepting and the American media particularly accepting uh, the dropping of these bombs, how that influences attitudes towards, uh, you know, future use. And that's why it's so important to kind of study this and, you know, uh, try to work our way out of that. I, I want to get to um, some of the specifics. I mean, some of the, the sort of the narratives that were established uh, in this film or, or maybe were established before, and this film was seen as a vehicle to, to, to promote those. But let's just start uh, with, with this for folks who, um, who are not as familiar with the history of the development of the bomb, and um, and then we can lead into how this 
how this film uh, got developed. But um, right. just say a few words on the Manhattan Project so that folks understand, you know, sort of like what, um, uh, you know, the Manhattan Project itself. So that folks have a, a, an understanding of what the film was ostensibly um, uh, retelling. OK, well, I'll do this incredibly briefly, I hope. Uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt launched and funded the Manhattan Project, a crash program to build the first, uh, split the atom, build the first atomic bomb. Uh, we had heard that the Germans were at work at this, and it was a race to beat the Germans. And this went on in 1943, 1944, 1945. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was the famous scientific chief. Leslie Groves, General Leslie Groves, was the, the overall director and the military chief. And, uh, you know, they did have their breakthrough, and um, they first tested the bomb uh, 75 years ago this month out in New Mexico. Uh, but by then, the Germans had surrendered, and the, the whole drive to make the bomb and use it was the, the fear of the Germans. Um, and, uh, of course, many of the Jewish uh, and uh, emigre scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project were very driven by uh, combating the Nazis. Um, so we tested the bomb successfully, and then the question was, what would we use it against Japan? Japan did not have a nuclear program. There was no fear of that. Japan was Greg, can you, completely can you surrounded. Hold, let me just Go stop on. you here. I just one 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 question. The so what was the um, I mean, broadly speaking, I can understand if you un, if you you were under the impression that uh, Germany is is pursuing this weapon that you want to get mm-hmm. there first. But what like what? What's the next part? <laughs> like, what's the end game? If it, it, or what was the thinking at that time? Uh, Germany is trying to get this weapon that that is uh, horrific. We need to get right. one too, so that what? Like, what happens theoretically? And I'm talking, you know, in the early '40s, while they're they're contemplating why you do this. Like, what was right. what you know? Like, as they did the steps out, right? As they sort of like game this out. What? Wh- how did they anticipate it would be used, or would it just simply its yeah. existence be a threat? Well, certainly some of the scientists hoped it would just be a threat, and there was even a, a conversation between Roosevelt and Churchill, where Churchill said, uh, you know, because the, the Brits were in on making the bomb, uh, and, you know, and Roosevelt said, well, you know, maybe we'll we'll just have to use it as a threat. But the fact is, you know, they anticipated using it um, against the Germans if if necessary. Um, now there is a whole school of thought that they never would have because uh, you know because the Germans were white, Western culture and so on and so forth. Where the Japanese, we had no qualms. So you know that is that is a, a possible factor. But yes, the idea was to make it and possibly use it. Um, you know the idea of a threat could have also been used with the Japanese. But uh, you know as you may know, we never explicitly warned the Japanese that we had this new weapon. We did demand that they surrender, but we did not say, we have a new weapon, uh, you probably have heard about it, uh, uh, or you've heard about what, what an atomic weapon could do, and you better quit now. Uh, that never happened with, uh, with the Japanese. Well, in fact, um, the film sort of uh, lies about that in some fashion, but we will, we will get, to, get to, to that. So, um, all right, so I'm sorry, continue. So the, um, uh, the, 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 the first test happens after right. the Germans have surrendered now, uh, or I should not say now, uh, the, around now, 75 years ago, uh, then, I'm sorry, continue. Well, okay. Well, then Truman, who had already sort of given the go-ahead uh, for the use of the bomb, uh, which, of course, he could have rescinded, but, you know, they were on, on uh, target to use it in early early August at some point. And he was at Potsdam, and he uh, he was meeting with Stalin and so forth, and he was all energized because we'd had this successful test. Now, the, the, the kind of the key, there's two key factors. Again, I, I can just say very briefly, um, which is not in the film. Uh, and again, this is a this is a movie. That, you should make clear this is an MGM big budget movie. It's not a documentary. So we're talking about a MGM an MGM drama, but um, you know. Truman also knew at Potsdam that the Russians were going to finally declare war on the Japanese in early August, and you know, uh, and Truman himself wrote in his diary, "Finny Japs when that occurs." Uh, he felt that the Russian declaration of war and entry would alone 
could, or not only could, but would produce a Japanese surrender. And he was aware of that. This is not something historians are, you know, looking back at, uh, you know, 75 years later. He wrote this himself in the diary. Um, so he could have waited uh, a short time for the, see what happens with the Russian invasion or, or declaration of war. Uh, the second factor was the, the uh, Americans were still calling for unconditional surrender. And the Japanese, you know, rejected this, but uh, there were many people close to Truman, including Stimson and John J. McCloy, you know, True Hawks, who said, look, this is this is crazy. If we tell them they can at least keep their emperor as a figurehead, uh, that may very well uh, produce surrender. And again, Truman did not do that. He still called for unconditional surrender. Uh, and then after the Japanese surrendered, we then let them keep the emperor. <laughs> so right. um, obviously people look back and say, wouldn't some combination of the Russian declaration of war and letting Japan keep their emperor produce surrender in, in virtually the same time frame as, uh, you know, as it did after the use of the bombs? Um, and, 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 and the point of all that being is really to get to why use the bombs? Right. I mean, there was oh, all yeah. I mean, and, and, and I think, you know, I, I mean, I, um, I I'm not sure that folks, uh, you know, uh, you know, were, uh, appreciate the um, the latitude that the United States had at that moment um, in terms of uh, of a decision of making the bomb. And I and I think that's, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about appreciate about your work. Um, so, and, and we'll tell more of that part of the story, I think, uh, through, um, the, the, the reshaping of the movie in some way. Um, right. Right. so, all right, but tell us about how, how did, so this movie is, they start production on this when, like it was a 1947, uh, uh, production, but that's usually just when they have finished. What, right. what was the genesis of this film and, um, and, and when did it start? Well, the genesis is kind of incredible. Uh, about two months after Hiroshima, um, the actress Donna Reed, who was a real favorite of mine as a as a youth, uh, received a, a letter from her former uh, high school chemistry student uh, teacher back in Iowa, named Edward Tompkins, and he, he had disappeared. And she found out that why the reason was is he had been involved with this top secret Manhattan project in Tennessee. Um, so he wrote her a letter, uh, this is, you know, again, two, two months or so after the bombing, begging her to get a, a movie studio to make a movie that would reflect the scientists' growing urgent uh, views that, you know, we were about to embark on building bigger and, uh, uh, and more weapon, nuclear weapons. Uh, this is going to lead to a nuclear arms race. The history, uh, the future of the world was imperiled. Um, and it was a real stark warning. And, of course, people like Einstein were involved in this uh, himself. Um, so it was a sort of begging her to get the studio interested in telling the story from the scientist's point of view, which was, you know, which was a, uh, an important, uh, important thing, obviously. And, and, and it so was Donna a point Reed of view. I mean, just to be one. just to be, you know, put a fine point on it. It was a point of view, which I think reflected some measure I don't know if regret is the right word, but 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 I would imagine deep, deep ambivalence at best as to right. their involvement in the project and where it has led, because right. like you say, a lot of these people uh, got involved because they 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 saw it as as an existential threat that was coming from Ger from Germany. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of them didn't know this was even a munitions project. It was more of a. Uh, in a way, a beautiful, as Oppenheimer put it, um, you know, scientific experiment. You know, split the atom, build a weapon. Uh, it actually works. You know, uh, let's go home. Um, right. But uh, once it was used, and you, and the way it was used, I mean, you know, it's a whole another you know half hour discussion on why the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki were targeted, why the bombs were dropped over the center of the cities, why the aim really was to kill civilians, and you know, mission accomplished. Uh, and um, so, you know, a lot of the scientists did have did have real qualms, and so they wanted to do something about it. They didn't want to just wring their hands. They wanted to, you know, stop uh, future production of the weapon for military uses. So, um, anyway, so they went to Donna, Donna Reed. Her husband happened to be an agent. Uh, he went to Louis B. Mayer, the head of the uh, MGM studio. Uh, 
mayor said, yes, we have to go ahead with this. It'll be the most important movie I ever make, big budget, et cetera, et cetera. And so the uh, they got a you know screenwriter and so on and so forth. So that process begins now as a a side not a, a sort of a major a sidelight running story in the book is also kind of the amazing story that uh, Paramount was uh, also launched the project similar project at the same time, and they hired Ayn Rand mm-hmm. as the screenwriter. Uh, and she most people don't even know she had been a screenwriter, but she had written uh, screenplays in Hollywood for a few years. So she was hired to write the competing script, and there's a great deal in the book. I would sort of was able to look at through all her outlines and drafts and letters and early scripts and everything. And so it's 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 people will get, have will kind of have some horrible laughs over the direction she took the story, as you can imagine. I can imagine. Hand. Super cap pro capitalist, the pro individual scientist must not be restrained, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, so you had these two competing projects going at the same time, and um, ultimately Paramount gave up and threw in with with MGM. Ayn Rand was, he was angry and went off to to write Atlas Shrugged. Um, nice. But uh, that's another another story. But um, but anyway, so then MGM had a clear field. But what it, what had happened was that they had the original scripts and the whole direction was to to express the scientists' warnings. But uh, then they went to Truman and uh, talked to him, and then they uh, signed a contract with General Groves and gave him $10,000, which is the equivalent of 130000 today, to be chief advisor. And Ro- uh, Groves essentially got script approval. So, so, wait, so let me stop you Groves here. Was a, well, Groves was a tremendous pro-bomb. Uh, he made fun of radiation effects. Uh, you know, he was like the worst person in the world you'd want to have more or less in charge of an MGM movie depicting the, you know, the making and use of the bomb. I'm not convinced he's not one of the worst people you'd want in charge of anything. I mean, this guy, you know, <laughs> honestly, like, you know, there's this, I'm sure he may have had uh, more military acumen, but but he sounds like you know, uh, like like Seb Gorka. I mean, in you know, in, in today's parlance, honestly. I mean, but 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 what? Tell me how uh, how we went from mayor and 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 presumably he was sincere about this um, in terms of like presenting. I mean, because they must have known that this was going to be at odds, at least to some extent, with the military, right? I mean, to, to, because they were expressly um, looking to, to promote or to tell the scientist's perspective. And, mm-hmm. and, and so they must have been aware that their perspective was unique and probably one that um, you know, the military didn't necessarily want to highlight. I mean, right. I mean, because yep. why else is there a story here? So how do they go from, we're doing this, um, you know, tell this story uh, for the, the scientists, w- which is one of like caution uh, and then go to Truman and go to Groves. I mean, the, the, like yep. uh, what, what was that process? I mean, certainly mayor knew, right? I mean, they, MGM had been putting out propaganda films and they knew, how this worked, didn't they? Well, I, I think they knew how it worked. And of course you have, you know, Mayer was a right-wing Republican. So I think, you know, he, he liked the idea of making this movie, but he wanted to make money, you know? Um, and he didn't, certainly didn't want to be at odds with the, uh, with the government and the military. So I think when he signed off on it and the early scripts were written, I think the feeling was, and, and it was rampant and rampant in our land concerns about the future with the bomb. And so I think they thought there was room in a movie to express, you know, military pride and, you know, uh, macho, uh, let's move forward with scientists, scientific caution. And, and, and indeed it is possible. The early drift, the, the early scripts kind of did that. Um, they weren't all just pro, you know, pro scientist, but the, the, those early scripts, which were, you might call uh, balanced, then got completely uh, turned in the other direction, one direction after, you know, Groves and Truman got involved. So, um, and, and MGM was, well, that's fine. I, this is the, most Americans are uh, certainly were supported the use of the bomb at that point. Um, it was a popular view that we had, had used the bomb. Um, and, um, you know, for box office, maybe we need to make a more, you know, more pro-bomb uh, picture. 
And so I, I don't think they needed much uh, urging to, to accept this, but they were over the barrel. Once they gave Grove script approval, um, they were kind of stuck with, you know, whatever he demanded. And he, maybe he went a little further than they expected. But, um, uh, you know, in a way, it's a Hollywood story. You know, they, the best intentions were led astray by, uh, you know, money and pressure from others. But this was, I should say, this was a very unusual to this point. There never had been a president who got so involved in a Hollywood movie. And there never had been a, you know, in a post-war, this was not the uh, wartime censorship, you know, um, with the military calling the shots on a movie like this. So it was very unusual. And, it, you know, and it makes for a kind of an exciting, dramatic story in the book because it's um you know it's a it's a uh, kind of an incredible narrative as it moves along now so to what extent from the perspective of okay so i understand you know um uh, uh mayor's uh intentions and where it you know got sidetracked and you know having spent some time in uh hollywood uh in my youth uh, none of that sounds surprising at all you start with this idea that we're going to have the the top actors in the country and by the end, um, uh, you you're getting you know, sort of like the uh, the, the all you know the the would bees uh, or uh, and and in fact that's how I got a lot of work uh, when I was in Hollywood. Uh, but <laughs> but p- putting that aside, from the perspective of of Truman of 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 Groves of the military broadly speaking, um, and 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 I guess maybe it's it's really uh, on some level it's it really is um, it really is Groves. Um, did, was there a conscious plan or awareness or desire or uh, understanding of the need to create a narrative that would um, make what we did less heinous? Yeah. Well, you know, um, let's put in also put in perspective because this is the, the, in this period that the what, what the pressure they felt they were under to defend Truman's decision. Now, again, you got to remember, first of all, that we even though there was incredible carnage during the war, and a lot of people have excused the atomic bombings because of that. You know, this these were two American acts. This is not like the Nazis and death camps. This is the Americans. Uh, dropping two bombs over two cities and killing all these people. Now, this had been partly hidden uh, to this point. You know, there, certainly we saw aerial photos of Hiroshima. Uh, we there were reports that tens of thousands had died and so forth. So it was not like a secret, but the full extent was not still not really known. There were no f- photos of uh, victims or survivors. There was no real sense of the human effects. The number of Fatalities were played down. The radiation effects were played down. Um, so you know, people had come to a, come to a sort of accept that uh, maybe this wasn't so terrible. Now, um, as we're looking at the script, are we just about a year or so out? I mean, it's it's so hard. I think for you know, even myself who grew up in a you know a largely um, or for at least you know a significant you know portion of my adult life in a sort of pre-internet era maybe you know uh, but <laughs> but but I, I think it's hard for people to understand how you could create that level of carnage and there being very little sort of like record or understanding of it you know contemporarily uh now right. uh, on the other hand of course you know, what did we see of Iraq after the, you know, the initial, you know, shock and awe and stuff like that? We, you know, as as it ground out. But I mean, um, the uh, so, you know, there there is at least an analog there that, you know, there is a there's always an attempt by the U.S. government. Um, and I would imagine all governments to hide what war looks like. Um, you know, at the very yeah. least, we know that Vietnam was in many respects uh, impacted you know, the American public's perspe- perception of, of Vietnam was impacted by the the level of television coverage it got. Um, right. And so, you know, that's the thing I think I just, you know, people need to understand here is that there was a huge vacuum. And did when 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 Truman got well, we had remember we had MacArthur, MacArthur had a 
uh, we had the U.S. occupation, MacArthur took over, and he had a censorship office in Tokyo. And even though the, the war was over, it was a wartime sort of censorship office. So all reports had to go through uh, MacArthur's office. And whether they were uh, the Japanese trying to tell their own story or American correspondents trying to who visited the cities, they had their stories subjected to, to uh, censorship or even being killed, which was done in many cases. Photos were basically pretty much banned. Uh, there was no free uh, – and I – actually, I mean, there's a couple pages in this book uh, uh, about the how the uh, U.S. seized all the Japanese uh, newsreel footage and uh, the uh, color footage shot by the American military. I wrote another book on it called Atomic Cover-Up and actually just finished directing a film of the same name. Um, all about the seizure of uh, the most historic film footage, uh, which then was locked up for decades. Um, so you have to appreciate that that this um, the full uh, story had not been told. And but then I should mention that right when the, the edits, the revisions of the uh, MGM film were uh, you know were happening, uh, lo and behold, John Hersey's article in the New Yorker came out. This is in August of 1946. And uh, of course, this has been called by some people the most famous or most important article of the century. And uh, he actually, you know, detailed the effect on on survivors or victims in, in Hiroshima and caused a national sensation. So in the the fall of 1946, when this film was going through its final editing, um, there was a, finally a bit of a backlash in the U.S. Uh, about the use of the bomb. So things really came to a head here in the, the autumn of 1946. The film was it was not yet finished, and this was when uh, again one of the major uh, sections in the book is about how then Truman uh, ordered uh, a retake of uh, the key scene that featured him in the movie, in which he sort of explains the decision to use the, use the bomb. He not only ordered and got this retake, but he also got the actor playing him fired. So, you know, this is all in this post-John Hersey uh, atmosphere uh, leading up to the actual release of the movie. So there, there. I mean, to the extent that we can tell, there became a more, a sort of like a greater urgency to promote this narrative. Um, Absolutely. That, you know, as time went on uh, over the course of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. All right, so outline for us like some of the uh, and 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 people should also it's also hard to appreciate this like you know an MGM movie the MGM movie the like you know from the perspective of people in 1947 this thing could be the defining narrative for 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 history on some level right, right? I mean yeah. like yeah. that's the thing it's hard to I think you know to appreciate today like oh a movie well there's five yeah. thousand you know a million of them that are being produced and there we're going to see on but that's not the way it was then <laughs> you know a a, yeah. a movie was a a major 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 event uh and I would imagine from the perspective of of uh Truman and and Groves and 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 also from the uh those scientists there was a real sense that this was um, that this this is something that, you know, w w we w would be in our consciousness for decades. This film, the story right. it tells. Um, yeah. And so so talk about the the you know, the the myths that were spread into the film that I think really do show um, one what what the U.S. government was worried about, what Truman was worried about, um, and what uh, Groves was worried about in terms of the way that we would be perceived, and, and particularly the way that we were perceived in terms of, like, was this really necessary? Right, right. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, there are were, there were many, 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 I mean, some were just what you might call details. Others were, were key parts of the narrative. But but just to give you on, on the detail and how far it went, you know, we needed to show that our attack on, on the two cities was um, risky, brave, you know, usual American gung-ho, uh, you know, uh, proud uh, aviator kind of thing. So they, uh, again, thanks to Groves and so forth, they injected into the script uh, that the, the, the bombers heading for Hiroshima 
were hit by anti-aircraft fire and flak, and then in a, a later script it became heavy flak, and then in a later script it became Japanese fighters uh, nearby about to maybe fire on them and shoot them down. This was all complete myth. None of that happened. We had clear sailing into Hiroshima, um, and uh, so that was all all made up. Uh, they also made up uh, that we dropped uh, uh, millions of leaflets over uh, Hiroshima, warning them that the atomic bomb was coming. And uh, again, no such thing happened. Uh, so just in those, to be, to, I want to be, I want to be explicit on that because I think that, like you know, that is really revealing on some level. We put leaflets, um, n- n- not before Hiroshima. We sent leaflets a- after Hiroshima, right? And then uh, to, to Nagasaki. Is that right? We uh, had we dropped leaflets, uh, calling ge- general calls for surrender. You should make your government surrender, and you know, bad things are coming. That kind of thing. Okay. After Hiroshima, they prepared all millions of leaflets to drop, and in fact, they did drop them over Nagasaki. But it was the day after Nagasaki was bombed, so mm. uh, that also is is obscured. But in the film, you know, again, so I go through these many details. You know, there are really too many to go into here, but it's it's revealing what what also was omitted, uh, maybe even more important. For example, how revealing is it that uh, the the, uh, the final movie, final cut of the movie, deleted any mention of Nagasaki? You could watch this movie and never know there was a second bomb. It was all of the early scripts. There was uh, plenty of Nagasaki. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, Nagasaki is even more questionably morally than Hiroshima, uh, and I go into it in the book, and you know, and, and so on and so forth. It just was, you know, the second bomb, even by people uh, who thoroughly endorsed the use against Hiroshima, are you know are sort of sickened by the uh, the use uh, against Nagasaki. So, um, so how they many? Had to get rid of how that. many? How you know, many? Nagasaki raised too many questions, so they had to get rid of Nagasaki completely. How many thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands, uh, 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 were were killed in in Nagasaki? Uh, probably about a hundred thousand, and Hiroshima was a uh, hundred and fifty thousand. So, and and in Nagasaki, I mean, Hiroshima was about eighty percent civilians, women mainly, women and children. Nagasaki, it was like ninety eight percent. Nagasaki did not have a major military base of any kind. It's been estimated that maybe one hundred military personnel were killed. In Nagasaki, and actually, there were about uh, several uh, several Dutch POWs that uh, were killed in Nagasaki. But um, um, so Nagasaki was wiped out of it, and of course, the film again in the editing um, omitted any mention of uh, the um, uh, the Russians entering, uh, mention of uh, this idea of having the keeping the emperor. Um, anything that complicated, and then of course, it also uh, built up the number of, of fatalities that were expected if there was a U.S. invasion. And this, you know, this, again, this has been debated for decades now, but, um, you know, they were claiming millions of American lives would be lost in an invasion, which, you know, is complete nonsense, especially with the weakened position of of uh, of Japan. And the invasion wasn't even scheduled till November, starting in November, and then you know, the second leg was early in, in 46. So it wasn't like they were on the verge of launching this D-Day type invasion of Japan. It was many months off, and right. so it adds to the adds to the feeling of many that Truman could have taken a few days or you know a couple weeks or something to uh, reconsider using uh, using the bomb against two cities. And and uh, uh, there's a scene in the movie uh, about uh, that implies that the, the Germans were you know some. The, that there was there was uh, bomb technology that was getting uh, rushed to Japan at that point as well, right? right? And well, that act, that's actually uh, I, I, I'll give Groves a little credit there. It was even too much for him. There there were mentions. Uh, they kept adding to the script uh, mentions for FDR mentions it. Uh, Groves mentions it in the scripts uh, that the Japanese might have atomic weapons. You know, our invaders might be met. By uh, atomic weapons from the Japanese, which again was complete complete nonsense. But the the the, the key the key scene that that did get uh, omitted was uh, they actually had the Germans arriving in a cove near Tokyo to deliver uh, nuclear technology to the Japanese, 
which would allow them to quickly build a bomb and, you know, defeat the Americans. And, uh, of course, the kicker was that the uh, Hiroshima lab or the, or the Japanese lab was in Hiroshima. So, I mean, it, it shows you how far they went to justify I mean, if you can imagine that, that they Hiroshima had to be bombed because they were building atomic weapons there that were going to be right. used against the Americans. So, so that shows how desperate they were. But, you know, you have to say that it showed incredible desperation and defensiveness. And, but, you know, they carried it off. And, uh, you know, again, the point of the book and the, the, the relevance for today is that, you know, 75 years later, basically uh, polls show most Americans still – endorse the use of the bomb against Japan. The media overwhelmingly endorses it. We've just seen the recent example of Chris Wallace's uh, book, uh, The Fox uh, Personality. Uh, he has, his book has become a number two bestseller about uh, the, the bombing, uh, which endorses the bombing. Um, and, uh, you know, every year, um, you know, the media, um, you know, tends to endorse the use of the bomb. And, and to this date, the only president who has said anything critical about it is uh, Eisenhower, who actually opposed the use of the bomb before it was used and then criticized it uh, you know, uh, later. And um, the only other president worth mentioning is Obama, who was the first president to ever visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki while in office, which... Uh, uh, which he didn't say anything critical of the bombing, but it took uh, 70 years for any U.S. president to even uh, you know visit Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Greg, uh, lastly, let me ask you this: in the course of all the research you've done around this, did you did did you ever find like where Groves or Truman or anybody you know involved in that uh, chain of command, um, you know, expressed some type of regret? Like I'm curious, like well, a guy like not, yeah, certainly not Groves I and mean, Groves, uh, and really Truman didn't either. We found uh, I did a book with Robert J. Lifton a few years ago in which uh, he he sort of analyzed Truman and found a couple glimmers of regret. But um, Truman, you know, famously uh, said to the end of his life, he never lost any sleep over it. Um, the, the key scene that that he had uh, this costly retake ordered that Truman himself ordered from the White House basically in, uh, involved showing that he, you know, he pondered this decision, he agonized over it, he, you know, he talked to everyone uh, over and over about it, uh, very deliberate uh, to, to show he, had, he, he, he did this all with a heavy heart and, and so on and so forth. But uh, he was once asked, uh, you know, how, how long it took him to make this decision, and he snapped his fingers to show how quickly he made the decision. So, um you know the again that's where the the revisions and retakes in the movie are so revealing that they wanted to express uh a certain view that would last and it has yeah it <laughs> frighteningly, really has frighteningly well, to this day it I, has lasted uh so uh in a way they they pulled it off well greg i I'll, I'll tell you that's frankly why you know um i i have such appreciation for the work that you've You've done in this book and 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 the others is because I think um, that's a narrative that um, I think most people just accept and uh, yeah. and 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 have never questioned and and there really is not you know as much of an opportunity to question that narrative as as there should be. The book is the beginning or the end. How Hollywood and America learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. We should also say just as a coda. The film did not do very well, and um, uh, by by that point, it wasn't going to achieve its at least the the mission of those scientists who had sort of initiated the thing. Greg Mitchell, we will put a link at Majority FM uh, to the book. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Sam, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Choice was made for the 
option where you don't get paid For the road that bends before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive 